North Cornwall, Fairies and Legends In Myth and Legends Around the World Collection 16 from Gutenberg.org This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by the one who wanders The Adventures of a Pisky in Search of His Laugh by Ennis Tregathan Introduction The tales contained in this little volume of North Cornwall Fairy Stories by Ennis Tregathan are either founded on folklore or they are folklore pure and simple. The scene of the first story is laid against the ancient walls and gateways of Grim Dundagel thronged along the sea and other places not quite so well known by those who live beyond the cornish land but which nevertheless have a fascination with their own especially dosma pool where trigigul's unhappy spirit worked at his hopeless task of emptying the pool with a crozen or limpet shell that had a hole in it this large inland lake one mile in circumference is of unusual interest not only because of Trigigal's legend that centres around Dosmar, but from a tradition which many believe that it was to this desolate moor, with its great tarn, that Sir Bedivere, King Arthur's faithful knight, brought the wounded king after the last great battle at Slaughter Bridge on the banks of the Camel. A wilder and more untamed spot could hardly be found in Cornwall than Dosmar Pool and the barren moors surrounding it. As one stands by its dark waters, looking away towards the bare granite-crowned hills and listening to the wind sighing among the reeds and rushes and the coarse grass, one can realise, to the full, the weird legends connected with it, and one can see, in imagination, the huge figure of Tregeagle bending over the pool, dipping out the water with his poor little limpid shell. The Tregeagle legends are still believed in. When people go out to Dosmer Pool, they do not mention Tregeagle's name for fear that the giant will suddenly appear and chase them off the moors. On the golden spaces of St. Minva Sand Hills, the legends about this unearthly personage are not so easily realised, except on a dark winter's night, when the wind rages fiercely over the dunes, and one hears a fearful sound, which the natives say is Tregeagle roaring because of the sand ropes that he made to bind his trusses of sand are all broken st minva is not only known for its connection to the legend of tregeagle but it is one of the many parishes beloved by the small people or fairy folk with whom ennis tregathan's little book has mostly to do piskies danced in their rings and on many a cliff and common and more in that delightful parish and on other wild moors, commons, and cliffs, in many another parish in north and east Cornwall. Fairy horsemen, locally known as night riders, used to steal horses from farmers' stables and ride them over the moors and commons till daybreak, when they left them to perish, or to find their way back to their stalls. Numberless stories of the little ancient people used to be told, which the cottagers often repeated to each other on winter evenings as they sat around the peat-fires, and some of these Ennis Tregathan has retold. The author writes concerning them, Many of the legends were told me by very old people long since dead. The legend of the Doomba was told me when I was quite a small child by a very old person born late in the eighteenth century. The one of the giant Tregeagle came, I think, from the same source, but it's too far back to remember. I only know it was one of the stories of my childhood, as were also the mole legend and some of the pisky tales, handed down from a dim past by our Cornish forebearers. The legends about the Pisky people were very old, and some assert today that the tales about the Piskies were tales of a pygmy race who inhabited Cornwall in the Neolithic period, and that they were answerable for most of the legends of our Cornish fairies. If this be so, 
The older stories are legends of the little stone men. The legends are numerous. Some of them are very fragmentary, but they are nonetheless interesting, for they not only give an insight into the world of the little ancient people, but they also show how strongly the Cornish peasantry once believed in them, as perhaps still they do. For, strange as it may seem, in these matters-of-fact days, that there are people still living who not only hold that there are piskies, but say that they have actually seen them. One old woman in particular told me not many months ago that she had seen little bits of men in red jackets on the moors where she once lived. She used to be told about the piskies when she was a child, and the old people of her day used to tell how the bits of men crept in through the keyhole of moorland cottages when the children were asleep to order their dreams. These stories are given to the world in the hope that many besides children for whom they are specially written will find them interesting, and all lovers of folklore will be grateful to know that the iron horse and other modern inventions have not yet succeeded in driving away the small people, nor in banishing the weird legends from our loved land of haunted charm. The Adventures of a Piskey in Search of His Laugh A Soft Cradle of Old Tales W. B. Yeats The moon was shining softly down on the grey ruins of King Arthur's castle by the Tintagel Sea, and on hundreds of little piskies dancing in a great pisky ring on the mainland, known as Castle Gardens. In the centre of the ring stood a little fiddler, fiddling away with all his might, keeping time with his head and one tiny foot. The faster he played and flung out the merry tune on the quiet moonlit night, the faster the piskies danced. As they danced, they almost burst their sides with laughter. Their laughter and the music of the little fiddler was distinctly heard by an old man and his wife, who then lived in the cottage near the castle. One pisky, somewhat taller than a clothes peg, was the best dancer there, and his laugh was the merriest. He was dancing with a pisky about his own size, who could hardly keep step with his twinkling feet. As the piskies careered around and round the pisky ring, a tiny chap, who was the best dancer, and had the merriest laugh, suddenly stopped laughing, and his little dancing feet gave under him, and down he went in a crash, dragging his little companion with him. Before they could pick themselves up, the piskies, who were coming on behind, not seeing the two sprawled on the ring, fell on them, and in another moment, little fiddler pisky saw a moving heap of green-coated little bodies and a brown tangle of tiny hands and feet. So amazed was he that such an unusual sight that he stopped fiddling and let his fiddle slip out his hands unnoticed on the grass. When the little men had picked themselves up, except the one who had caused a mishap, they began to pitch into him for tumbling and causing them to tumble, when something in his tiny face made them stop. "'What made you go down on your stump jacket, like when you're dancing so beautifully?' asked a pisky, not unkindly. "'I don't know,' he answered, looking up at his little brother, Pisky, with a strange expression on his face, which was pinched and drawn and pale as one of their own pisky stools, and instead of a laugh in his little dark eyes, there was misery and woe. The strange expression in his eye quite frightened the piskies, and one said, "'What's the matter with you? You're looking worse than a cat in a fit.' "'Am I?' said the poor little pisky. Oh, "'I am feeling quite queer. "'Twas a queerness that made me fall on my little stump jacket. "'Am I ill like those great men and women creatures "'we sometimes entice in the bogs with pisky lights?' "'We've never heard of a pisky getting ill or sick,' said a little brown pisky, have we?' Turning to speak to the little fiddler, who had come over to his companions, bringing his fiddle with him. "'We most certainly haven't,' answered the little fiddler. "'Then what's the matter with me, if I'm not sick?' asked the little pisky, who was looking so queer. "'Perhaps grant for a pisky will be able to tell you, for I can't,' said the little fiddler. "'Where's Grant for Pisky?' asked the poor little sufferer. "'I'm afraid I'm getting worse, 
for all the dance has left my legs. Grandfather Pisky's over on the island, cried little Pisky. So he is, said all the other Piskies, sending their glances in that direction, where, on the edge of the beetling cliff, facing the castle gardens, stood a tiny old man, with a white beard flowing down to his bare little feet. He was dressed, as were all the other Piskies, in a bright green coat and a red stocking cap. He disappeared into a Pisky hole the Piskies had dug in the cliff, which led down to an underground passage between the island and the mainland, and very soon he reappeared from another hole in Castle Gardens, a few feet from where the little Piskies were anxiously awaiting him. "'Why are you not fiddling, dancing, and laughing?' asked the little white beard, winking his eyes on the silent little Pisky crowd, standing near their little Pisky brother, who was looking so queer. "'You're waiting precious time, standing here doing nothing, before a great wall, the moon will have set over Travos, and the time for merry making and high jinks will be over," he added, as not a pisky spoke. "We're not fiddling, dancing, and laughing because of someone that's befallen our little brother," said the tiny fiddler at last, pointing to the poor little pisky who had raised himself to a sitting position and was seated on the pisky ring. Well, "He's a rum-looking old customer, sure enough." said the old white beard, glancing in the direction of the place where the little fiddler pointed. "'What's the matter with him?' "'That's what we want to know,' asked the little fiddler. "'Come have a closer look at him, Grandfather Pisky.' And Grandfather Pisky came. "'What's the matter with him?' asked one of the Piskies, when the white beard had stared down a minute or more on the little atom of misery sitting humped up on the edge of the great green ring like a toad on a hot shovel. "'You're so old and wise. Will you be able to tell us what ails him, if anybody can? He thinks he's sick like the big people. We lead a fine dance around the fields and common sometimes.' As Gamfer Pisky stood stock still before the little afflicted Pisky, winking and blinking and solemnly shaking his head. "'He's not sick like the people whom you spoke.' said the white beard at last. He is. The make-outs, shrilled a little voice, with a laugh somewhere in the background. No, he hasn't the make-outs, you impudent little rascal. The gamfer pisky, without lifting his gaze from the poor little fellow on the edge of the ring. That's a complaint from which you apparently suffer. What has he? asked the tiny fiddler, impatiently scraping his fiddlestick over his fiddle, as if to emphasise his words. It isn't what he has, but what he hasn't, said the old white beard in the same slow, solemn voice, I was going to say that our poor little brother has lost his laugh. Lost his laugh? cried little Fiddler Pisky, and all the other little Piskies, and their tiny faces of consternation showed what a terrible thing had befallen their poor little brother. Yeah, he's had the same misfortune to lose his laugh, said the little old white beard, winking and blinking harder than ever as he stood before the unhappy little Pisky, who had lost his laugh. And worse still, he's quite done for till he finds it again. Well, where's my laugh gone, Gamfer Pisky? asked the miserable little Pisky, who had met with the dreadful misfortune. Oh, I don't know more than the little man on the moon, answered the tiny old white beard. But if I were you, I would go back and look for it. Where must I go and look for my laugh? asked the poor little Pisky. I had not the smallest idea but I should go and search for it till I found it. Will you come with me and search my laugh? asked the little Pisky, with a look of anxiety on his wee dark eyes, as Gamfer Pisky was moving away. I'm afraid I can't. It's my duty to stop with your brothers and say they don't grow silly and lose their laugh. Besides, it's not quite the thing for an old white beard like me to go travelling about the country with a youngster like you in search of a laugh. "'Will you go with me to look for my laugh?' asked the little Pisky, fixing his gaze on the tiny fiddler. "'I would go with you gladly, if I were not fiddler, Pisky,' he answered, touching his fiddle lightly with his bow. "'But if I were to go gallivanting up and down the country in search of your laugh, oh, there would be nobody to play the dancing tune with our brothers, dance in the moonshine.' "'Won't one of you go with me to help me find my laugh?' 
begged the miserable little fellow, glancing from one pisky to another as they crowded round him. Oh, "'We would if we hadn't got so much dancing to do,' they said. "'We have to dance in every pisky ring from Tintagel Head to Crackington Horn, up St. Jenny's, before the moon grows as small as a wren's claw.' "'Must I go by myself to search my love? said the poor little pisky in a heart-breaking voice. "'Yes, you must go by yourself to look for your laugh,' answered all the little piskies. "'You should not have been so selfish as to lose it.' And the selfish little brown men, Grandfather Pisky, Fiddler Pisky, and all the other piskies, turned their backs on their unfortunate little brother and ran away across the gardens and over the cliffs towards Bosony, halfway between which was another big pisky ring. And by and by the poor little pisky, who had lost his laugh, heard in the distance, as he sat all alone in the great grassy place, their merry laughter and the music of Fiddler Pisky's tiny fiddle. He was a very sad little Pisky as he listened to the merriment of his little brother Pisky's, and the moon sailing along the dark velvety blue of the midnight sky above the ruins of King Arthur's castle in the gardens, never looked down on such a woe-begotten little Pisky before. He had always been happy and gay till now, and having no laugh was such a strange experience that it was no wonder he felt as miserable and wished as he did. As he sat there, all alone, on the ring his own little dancing feet had helped to make, two tiny hands were suddenly thrust up out of the small earth heap, half a foot down from where he was sitting. So dainty were the hands that he thought they belonged to one of the little good people, a distant relation of his, and thinking that somehow one had gotten buried under the earth, he got up from the ring to help her out, and, without waiting to say, allow me, or anything so polite, he caught hold of the wee hands, and pulling with all his strength, he dragged something very dull and soft out of the earth heap, and saw, to his surprise and disgust, that it was the round, plump body of a mole. He kept his eyes upon the light, and by and by, when the lantern came rocking over the bog in his direction, he stood up on the edge of the water, ready to call. It disappeared ever so many times among the bog myrtles and willows, but every time it reappeared it was closer. When it came near, enough for him to see the little lantern man inside, he shouted, "'Whatever did you drag me out of that wanton hill for, you horrid creature, whoever you are?' cried the mole, who was not as soft as she looked. "'It took me two hours to throw up that beautiful hill, and now it's fallen down into my tunnel. My work would all have to be done over again.' thanks to you. Oh, I'm so sorry, said the Pisky. I saw two dinky hands sticking up, and I thought a relation of mine had gotten buried. When I did my best to get her out, I found it was only a want, as the country people call you moles. You're a want indeed, exclaimed the mole. Who are you, pray, to speak so disdainfully? If I'm not a want, I was not always the poor thing I am now. Once upon a time, I was a very great lady, and because I was foolish and proud and very vain of my beauty, I was turned into a mole. My little hands are the only thing left to me to show who I once was. Oh, I'm very sorry for you, said the Pisky, with a strong note of sympathy in his voice, so entirely new to him that he scarcely knew it was he himself speaking. For Piskies, although they are merry and gay, are often selfish in the extreme. "'I'm more sorry for you than I can say,' he went on. "'It can't be nice to be only a want, when once you're a beautiful lady. "'I'm a pisky, as the dark little mole was silent. "'A pisky, are you?' she cried, speaking at last. "'I remember you little pisky people quite well, and have cause to remember. "'Once, when I was a grand lady and wore fine clothes, "'you piskies led me into a bog and spoiled my silken gown. "'I did not bless you then, and I do not bless you now.' You are still up to your tricks. I find to my cost, for you have done your best to pull down my house about my ears. Oh, I didn't mean to do anything so unkind, said the little Pisky. Oh, I'm not merry enough now to play games on anyone. How's that? asked the Mole. Oh, I've lost my laugh. My heart's heavy as lead, he answered sorrowfully. Lost your laugh? cried the Mole. That's very strange. 
Oh, yes it is, and I'm quite done for. So Grandfather Pisky told my little brothers till I find it again. Why don't you go and look for your laugh instead of throwing down want hills? said the Mole severely. It would be more to your credit if you did. Well, I suppose it would, replied the Pisky, but unfortunately I don't know where to go, and I look for my laugh. Have you seen it? No, I haven't, snapped the Mole. I can't see without my eyes, and I've lost my eyesight through working underground for so many long centuries. Oh, do you know anybody who's seen my laugh? asked the Pisky. Would kindly tell me where to go find it? I'm afraid I don't, answered the Mole, except the little man in the lantern. He's the most likely person I know to have seen your laugh. He's always flipping about the country in the night time with his little lantern. He sees most things that wander by night. He's a kind-hearted little fellow. Uh, if he's seen your laugh, he'll be sure to help you to find it. You know, of course, where the little man is to be found. Oh, I've seen his lantern in the marshes sometimes, answered the Pisky. I saw it rush by a few weeks ago when I and my brothers were lying snug and warm in a great Pisky bed at Rough Tor Marsh. But uh, I do not happen to know the lantern man. W would you please come with me to Rough Tor Marsh and ask him if he's seen my laugh? next will you ask me to do cried the mole no i cannot go with you i'm far too busy to go tramping around the country with a little brown pisky like you in search of a laugh i have to tunnel to make across castle gardens for my dear little baby wants to run about in and i must do it before the sun shines over the tours if you really want to find your laugh you must go and ask the lantern man yourself the sooner you go the better or you may lose the chance to ask him if he's seen it I dare say you're right, said the little Pisky, with a heavy sigh. But I don't like the idea of travelling all the way from here to Rough Tor Marsh. My feet are heavy like my heart now. I've lost my laugh, and yet I suppose I must go, for I'm a wished poor thing without it. Wouldn't you say so too, Mrs. Mole, if your eyesight wasn't so bad? Mrs. Mole, indeed! snapped the velvet-coated little creature, raising her tiny hands in anger at such an insult. I beg to tell you that I am not Mrs. Mole, but I am the Lady Want, and that, although I have fallen from my high estate, I am still a lady of high degree, as my tiny hands bear witness. And she held them out for him to see. Oh, I'm not up to fine distinctions, said the little Pisky in a humble voice. No, I beg your ladyship's pardon. The Pisky's sad little voice so appeased the lady want that she fully forgave his ignorance and told him he was quite nice mannered for a Pisky and hoped the little lantern man had seen his laugh and would be able to tell him where to find it. And then her little ladyship disappeared into the molehill, her tiny hands and all. When she'd gone, the little Pisky turned his face toward the east, where the tors rose up dark and shadowy against the moonlit sky. Then he looked back at the great keep and turned his glance on the castle gardens where, in the long ago, courtly knights and great ladies walked among the flowers that blossomed there under the shadow of the loopholed walls and listened, as they walked, to the music of the Tintagel Sea and the great waves that sometimes broke against the dark cliffs or the headland in which the grim old castle stood where good King Arthur was born. The little Pisky was saying good-bye to that delightful spot, and, with its soft turf and the beautiful pisky ring on which he had danced times without number, for the poor lonely little fellow did not know if he should ever come back again. Then he broke off a bit of knapweed stem for a staff to help him on his journey to Rough Tor Marsh, and, before the moon had laid down a lane of silver fire on the rippling waters between Tintagel Head and Travos, the little pisky had set out on his travels in search of his laugh. Piskies always travel by night, and after many nights of wandering, the little Pisky, who had lost his laugh, came to the bog country, where he had last seen the little lantern. Very tired and footsore was that little Pisky, after his long journey. For having lost his laugh, he had no dance in his feet to help him along, and he felt so done up as he sat by the great bog, or Pisky bed, as he called it, that he had not much care whether he found his laugh or not. But when he had rested a while, he felt better, and looked over at the great marshy place with eager eyes, to see if the little lantern man was anywhere about. 
To his delight, for far away in the distance, he saw the white gleam of his lantern. Little man in the lantern, please stop. I, I want to ask you something. But whether the lantern man heard or not, he did not stop, and he and his lantern flipped by the disappointed little Pisky as quick as a witty mouse on the wing, and was lost to sight in the reeds and rushes on the other side of the great marsh. After a while, the little lantern man came back to the place where the Pisky was still standing, and the light from the lantern was brighter and softer than a hedge full of glow-worms light shining all at once. As the lantern was passing the little Pisky, he called out louder than before, "'Little man on the lantern, please stop. I want to ask you something.' But the little lantern man did not stop, and he and his lantern rushed by as quickly as before, and the poor little Pisky followed the rocking lantern with his eyes over the great marsh. Just as he was in despair of the wonderful little lantern coming his way again, it came, and so fast did it come, and so afraid was he of its passing him without making himself heard, that he shouted with all his might, "'Please, little lantern man, stop! I want to ask you something!' And to his joy the little lantern man stopped. The door of his little lantern opened wide, and a tiny shining face looked out. "'Did anybody call?' asked the lantern man in a voice so kind that the Pisky's little heart leapt for joy. "'Yes, I called,' said the little Pisky. "'I called twice before, but you did not stop.' "'I never heard you till now,' said the little lantern man. "'Who are you, and what do you want?' Oh, "'I'm an unfortunate little Pisky who's lost his laugh,' answered the Pisky. "'And I've tramped all the way from Tintagel Head to Rough Tor Marsh to ask you if you've seen it. "'Lost your laugh, you poor little chap!' ejaculated the little lantern man in the same kind voice. "'How came you to lose it?' The little Pisky told him how he'd lost his laugh, and what Grandfather Pisky had said, and how the mole who'd called herself the Lady Want had told him to come to him. "'I would gladly help you to find your laugh, if I knew where it was,' said the lantern man, when the Pisky had told him all. "'But, unfortunately, I've never seen it.' "'Haven't you?' cried the poor little Pisky. "'I am disappointed. I, as you're always travelling about the country in your little lantern, I, I felt sure you'd seen my laugh.' "'I only travel the marshy ground,' said the little lantern man, still standing in the doorway of his tiny lantern. "'And your laugh may not have passed along my way.' "'Oh, do you... Do you happen to know anybody else who's seen my laugh? asked the Pisky, anxiously. Well, nobody except Giant Trigiggle, of whom I dare say you'll have heard. That unhappy fellow, who, for some terrible wrongdoing, has to dip Dosma Pool dry with a limpid shell. Oh, yes, I've heard about the great giant from Grandfather Pisky, answered the little Pisky. He was a wicked seigneur who once had a fine house in Dosmore Pool, and a great park on Bodmin Moors, and he's often flying about the country with the wicked one at his heels. The very same, cried the little lantern man. He travels from east to west, from west to south, and back again. He will be sure to have seen your laugh. Oh, I'm afraid my laugh's too small for a great big giant to have noticed, even if it passed him, said the little pisky. "'Well, he isn't so big, but what he can see a laugh,' said the little lantern man. "'You'd better go and ask him.' "'I don't know where he is,' said the little Pisky, who was in the most dejected frame of mind. "'He's at Dolzmere Pool, or was not long since, doing his best to dip the pool dry.' "'Oh, I'm rather tired of tramping here from Tintagel.' said the little fellow, and I don't feel like going all the way to Dosmar Pool. I've no spring in my leg since my laugh left me, he added, as the little lantern man smiled rather sadly. I never knew what it was to be so tired and wished before I lost my laugh. I don't suppose you did, you poor little chap, cried the lantern man, and you must do all you can to find your laugh. I'm going to Dosmar Pool or the Magic Lake. 
as it was called in the long ago, and if you don't mind travelling in my lantern, I'll give you a lift as far as that. Or will you? exclaimed the little Pisky, his tiny brown face brightening as the lantern man smiled. Oh, you're very kind. I'll go with you gladly. That's right, cried the little lantern man, and he held out his hand, which shone like his face and helped the little brown Pisky into his lantern. When the Pisky was safe inside the lantern, he thought it was the very brightest place he was ever in, or even brighter than the fairy's palace, he said. "'There's no seat in my lantern except the floor,' said the little lantern man, as the Pisky looked about him. "'The floor's not uncomfortable, even if you care to sit down. I always sleep on it, when my night work of giving light to the poor things that live in the marshes is done.' Oh, "'I'd rather stand, thank you,' returned the Pisky. Oh, "'I can look out of your windows better.' "'Do as you like. Only it is my duty to tell you that you would be safer on the floor.' My lantern and I travel so fast that the creatures that fly by night often knock up against us and turn us upside down. The little lantern man shut the door of his lantern as he was speaking, and in another minute they were rushing over the rough tor marsh at a fearful speed, and the little pisky had to hold on to the frame of one of the tiny windows to keep himself on his feet. By rough tor's granite-piled heights the bright little lantern went, on by Bron Willie and Brown Willie it sped, and by many a solitary hill, almost as wild and untamed as old Rough Tor itself. Over lonely moors, bogs, rivers and streams it flew, and rocked and whirled as it went. As it sped on it bumped against all manner of strange creatures, and once a night hawk turned the little lantern upside down, and the Pisky found himself standing on his head, with his tiny lean legs sticking up in the air and he looked so funny that the little lantern man laughed till tears ran down his shining face, and if the Pisky had had his laugh, he would have laughed too. On and on the lantern rushed, zigzagging up and down, down and up, and as it went strange moths and queer things that go about only by night fluttered their wings against the bright windows and door. Once a witty mouse with a face like a cat looked in and then vanished into the darkness, and once a short-eared owl gripped the lantern in his talons, but it sped on all the same. About an hour after midnight, the lantern reached Dosmere Pool, which lies on the top of a great lonely moor, surrounded by desolate hills. The moon was only a few days old, and it had set long before the sun had gone down. But it was by no means dark by the big pool, for there was starshine from innumerable stars, and also the light that fell from the wonderful little lantern. The little lantern man stopped his lantern on a boulder by the pool, where was stretched a huge dark form, almost as big as a headland. It was giant Tregeagle, lying face down on the margin of the pool, dipping water with a limpet shell which had a hole in it. The little lantern man opened the door of his lantern, and telling the little Pisky that now was his chance to ask the giant about his laugh, he helped him out. The Pisky stepped up quite close to the great giant, and he looked so tiny beside him that the little lantern man laughed, and said that he was like a god's little cow by the side of a plough-horse. Why, he said, his ear alone could make a dozen little chaps like you and me. Now I must be off, and give light to those poor things that want light. Good luck to you, my friend, in finding your laugh. And the little lantern man closed the door of his lantern which sped away over the big pool, shedding light as it went. The Pisky watched the lantern till it was hidden among the reeds and rushes, and then he turned his face to the giant's ear, and when he had climbed up onto it, he shouted, "'Joint Tregeel! Joint Tregeel! I'm poor little Pisky who's lost his laugh! Please stop dipping water for a minute and tell me if you've seen it!' But the giant took no notice of the little Pisky, went on dipping out water with a limpet shell that had a hole in it. Again and again the tiny brown Pisky shouted into the giant's ear, but the big giant took no more notice of his little piping voice than if a fly had buzzed close to his ear, and went on dipping. Once more the Pisky shouted with all the voice he had, thrusting his red-capped head into the hollow of the giant's ear as he shouted, "'Giant Tregeagle! Giant Tregeagle! I'm a poor little Pisky who's lost his laugh!' 
please stop dipping water for a minute and tell me if you've seen it. This time the giant heard, and without pausing for a moment his hopeless task of emptying the pool dry, he said, What tiny squeak did I hear? The Pisky was too frightened to answer, for Giant Trigeagle's voice was almost as loud as the roar of the breakers breaking in the cavern under King Arthur's castle, and the tiny fellow crouched down in the curl of the giant's ear. "'What tiny squeak did I hear?' again asked the giant, and the little Pisky, taking his courage in both his hands, answered back as loud as he could. It was a little pisky who spoke to you, a little pisky who's got the great misfortune to lose his laugh. A little pisky has lost his laugh, has he? roared Giant Tregeagle. Why, that's nothing compared to a giant who's lost his soul. Have you lost your soul? cried the little pisky, who, having got the giant's ear, could now make his tiny voice distinctly heard. Yes, I lost my soul, moaned the great fellow and his moan shivered over the surface of Dosmer Pool, and made all the sallows that grew beside it shiver and shake, as if a blasting wind had passed over them, and the reeds and rushes growing in the water sighed so sadly that the little pisky felt ever so wished, and sighed too. "'How did you come to lose your soul, Mr. Giant?' asked the little pisky after a while. "'That's a question,' answered the giant, beginning again his hopeless task of emptying the pool. "'Have you ever looked for your soul?' queried the tiny fellow, who, having lost his laugh, felt very sorry for the unhappy giant, who had lost so precious a thing as his soul. "'It was not good to look for my soul when I gave it away in exchange for wealth,' cried the giant. "'I can never get it back again unless I empty this big pool of every drop of water that is in it. And "'Can't you do that? And you, a giant?' asked the little Pisky in surprise. "'I am afraid I can't, with a limpid shell that has a hole in it, and I'm not allowed to use any other.' "'Will, will, will you let me help you empty the pool?' asked the tiny Pisky. "'I'm only a little bit of a chap compared to you, but I know it's God's little cow by the side of a plough-horse, the man in the lantern said.' And as the giant laughed sardonically, uh, My dinky hand is nothing for size, but it hasn't a hole in it. You can help me if you like, said the giant with another sardonic laugh. It will be perhaps another case of a mouse freeing the lion. Who knows? cried the pisky, who took the giant's remark quite seriously, and climbed out of the huge ear. He slid down over the boulder to the pool, and making a dipper of his tiny hand, began to dip out water as fast as he could, and never stopped dipping once, till a movement behind him made him pause, and, looking up, he saw the great big giant on his feet, towering above him like a tor, with an awful look of rage upon his face. "'I can never, never empty Dosmer Pool with a limpet shell that has a hole in it,' howled the giant. "'No, not if I dip till the day of doom.' and he flung the shell into the pool. As he flung it, a great blast of rage broke from him, and lashed the dark water of the big pool in fury. He howled and howled, and his howls were heard in every part of the lonely waste surrounding the pool, and went roaring round and round the far-reaching moors, and were echoed by the desolate hills. By and by the giant turned his back on the pool, and strode away in the direction of the sea, howling and roaring as he went. The little Pisky was so terrified by the giant's roaring that he crept into a water rat's hole, and never ventured out for a night and a day. The second night, after the giant had gone, he came out of the hole to see if he had returned, but he had not. He was disappointed, in spite of the fright he had received, for the giant had never told him whether he had seen his laugh, and he did not know where to go in search of it, or whom to ask if it had been seen. As he thought about this, he became very miserable, almost as miserable as the unhappy giant who had sold his soul 
and he wished with all his heart that the kind little man in the lantern would come by his way again. As he was wishing this, he looked over the big pool, which was very dark and unlit by a single star, when something very soft and bright smote the black water on the opposite side of the pool. Thinking it was the dear little man of the lantern come and answered his wish, he fixed his gaze upon the brightness, and in a minute or two a little barge shot out from the reeds and came swiftly towards him, and he saw, for Piskies can see in the dark like a cat, that the barge was being rowed across the big pool by a little old man. The soft light that smote the water came from the prow of the little craft and lit up the face of the bargeman which was half turned towards the bisky, and was very seared and brown. When the barge came near the pool where the bisky was standing, the tiny bargeman said, Who are you, looking as if you had the world on your back? And what are you doing here, this time of night, when all good folk ought to be in bed? Oh, oh I'm a poor unfortunate bisky who's lost his laugh, answered the tiny little bisky, and his voice was very sad. "'Oh, it's a dreadful thing to lose your laugh,' said the old bargeman. "'It is,' responded the little pisky. "'The little man in the lantern thought so too, "'and he brought me all the way from Rough Tormash to Dosmar Pool in his lantern "'to ask Joint Tregeagle if he'd seen it.' "'And didn't you ask Joint Tregeagle that important question? "'After the little lantern man had brought you so far?' asked the little bargeman. No, "'I did!' But he was so troubled about something he'd lost, his soul it was, that he forgot to say whether he'd seen my laugh. Oh, that's a pity, for the giant is now in St. Minva Sandhills making trusses of sand and sand ropes to bind with them. And when the sand ropes break in his hands, which they're sure to do when he tries to lift them, he'll fly away to low bar to work at another impossible task. How do you know that? asked the little pisky. The tiny bargeman looked at the green-coated, red-capped little pisky with a strange expression in his dark eyes for a second or two, and then he said, "'I've lived so long in the world that I know most things. People who knew me in far-away time called me Merlin the Magician, and I said I had all the secrets in the world in the back of my head.' "'Well, then you'll be able to tell me where my laugh's gone.' struck in the little pisky eagerly i was speaking more of the past than the present said the tiny bargeman since the time in which i spoke i've lived here by this lake now called dosmer pool i live sealed up in a stone into which the lady of the lake shut me till a hundred or so years ago how oh, very unkind of the lady to put you into a stone said the little pisky indignantly. Whatever did she do it for? Thereby hangs a tale, which is not good for a small pisky like you to hear, returned the tiny bargeman, with another strange look at his dark, mysterious little eyes. When Nimu, lady of the lake, shut me up in the stone, like a toad in a hole, she said, she thought she'd done it for me, and I should soon die. But Merlin... The man who worked magic was not so easily got rid of. And didn't you die? asked the pisky innocently. You must have lost your wits as well as your laugh to ask such a stupid question, said the tiny bargeman. I didn't die, nor should I be sitting in this barge now. But I grew down to the tiny old fellow you see me through working my way out to that dreadful stone. My magical powers have also dwindled, I fear, for... There is nothing to what they once were. Therefore, I am no longer Merlin the Magician, but only Merlin the Bargeman of Dosmer Pool. And I can't... Can't you tell me where my laugh is? Asked the little pisky, wistfully. I am a miserable poor thing without my laugh. I am sure you are, said the tiny bargeman, and I'll do what I can to help you find it. Why, it wasn't shut up in stone all those centuries from nothing as perhaps you've not lost your laugh for nothing. I'll tell you at once that your laugh has never been near this desolate spot. 
but it is possible that giant Tregeagle may have seen it on his wild flight down St. Minver Sandhills, or maybe seen it in the Golden Dunes. I advise you to go there and ask him. How can I get to the Sandhills? asked the poor little Pisky. Oh, it would take me such a long time to get there with no dance in my feet. And there's no little lantern man here to give me a lift in his lantern. You need not trouble your head. Oh, you're to get to the sand hills. Oh, I'll take you near there in my barge. In your barge? Echoed the little Pisky, looking over his shoulder to the long stretch of country between him and the sea. And then at the great pool, set like a cup on top of the moor, with no visible outlet. You're wondering how I can take you to the great outer sea, said the tiny bargeman. For your satisfaction... I'll tell you that there is an underground waterway that leads down to Trebetherick Bay, close to St. Minver Sandhills. I'll take you there in my barge. Oh, you're so very kind, said the little Pisky, looking gratefully at the little old bargeman. My brothers were not nearly so kind. I saw you helping the wicked giant to dip his great mere dry, and I thought so kind a deed deserved another, answered the little bargeman lightly. I told myself as I watched you that I would do you a kindness. So, if you need a kindness, will you let me take you to Drabetherick Bay? Oh, gladly, answered the little Pisky. Get my barge, then, cried the little old bargeman. And the Pisky scrambled in and sat at the stern of the barge facing the bargeman. I like rowing about this pool, remarked the tiny bargeman, as he put his little craft about and began to row from the shore. It has so many memories. It was here by the mere that the Lady of the Lake, not the one who shut me up in stone, forged the wonderful Excalibur, the two-handled sword with which the jewelled hilt she gave to King Arthur, who, you know, afterwards ruled all the land. It was here that Sir Bedivere, one of the knights of the far-famed round table, flung the sword by order of the wounded king, and it was caught by the late lady's uplifted arm. It was here. But you're not listening, he cried, breaking off his sentence as he noticed that the little Pisky was not paying attention to anything that he was saying. No, I'm afraid I wasn't, he said, very much ashamed. I'm very dull and stupid since I lost my laugh. You can't be more stupid than when I was shut up in stone, said the tiny old bargeman, and I can well excuse your stupidity. He said nothing more, for just then the barge reached the shore from which it had put off, and, without getting out, he reached over and touched a big stone with an oar. He'd no sooner touched the stone than it sprang back and revealed a dark, deep tunnel, into which the little barge shot like a thing alive. This underground waterway was known to the fair ladies who lived by the pool, and who took away the wounded king and their little ship to the Vale of Avalon remarked the bargeman, when the stone shut itself up behind them. "'Did they?' asked the little Pisky, trying to look interested. "'Yes,' he answered. "'And they knew a thing or two about Waterway, which will never be revealed to anybody except by the good king,' he added half to himself, looking straight before him in the darkness to the narrow passages he steered. "'The tiny barge, which is a very ancient-looking little craft, with a gilded dragon forming its prow, sped on. But for its size it might well have been the same little ship to which Merlin, the little old bargeman, had just referred. The waterway was very long and deep, and the water ran so swiftly that the barge did not now require to be rowed. It was also very dark, and the only light that shone was the light from the little boat. The little old bargeman didn't speak again until a roaring fell on their ears. "'It's the noise of the water breaking on Padstow Dumbar, he said, as the little Pisky looked frightened. "'Oh, he thought it was a giant tregeagle howling!' gasped the little Pisky. "'Ah, he hasn't tried to lift his sand ropes yet, and he won't begin his howl of rage till he finds how brittle they are,' said the little bargeman. "'And a very good thing for you,' he added, "'for he'll be far too angry to tell you whether he's seen your laugh "'when the ropes of sand break in his great hands. "'There, we're close now to the great outer sea,' he cried, 
as the thunder of waves broke more loudly on their ears, and they saw the light of many stars through a narrow opening. And the next minute, the little barge came out into Terbethric Bay. You only got to go up across the hillocks, said the little old bargeman, helping the little pisky out of the barge. And if you follow your nose, you'll soon get to where the giant is busy making sand ropes. Thank you for bringing me, said the little pisky. But he never knew whether he was heard or not, for the tiny bargeman and his ancient barge vanished as he spoke. The pisky made haste to follow his nose, and he scrambled up a sandbank and hastened as fast as his feet could take him over the sandy common, till he came to the place where the giant Tregeagle was sitting, making sand ropes to bind his trusses of sand, which lay all around him. He was sitting by a hillock, his great head showing just above it, when the pisky came near. The little pisky climbed nearly to the top of the hillock, and when he got close to the giant's ear, he shouted, "'I am the little pisky who told you he'd lost his laugh. Please, stop making sand ropes for a minute and tell me if you've seen it.' But the giant took no notice of the tiny voice, and went on making his ropes of sand. The little pisky then got into his ear, and poked his red-capped head into the hollow of it, and again shouted, "'I'm the little pisky who told you t he'd lost his laugh, and—' "'Ah, the dinky fellow who tried to help me to find my soul,' interrupted the great giant, in a voice almost as loud as the waves breaking on the Padstow Doombar. "'Yes,' answered the pisky, "'and a dinky old bargeman brought me from Dosmer Pool to Trebethric, that you might answer my question.' "'I know who you mean, Merlin.' The little old master of magic, cried the giant, in evident astonishment, pausing in his work of making a rope of sand to stare at the little pisky. Fancy his bringing a tiny fellow like you from Dosmer Pool to Trebethic Bay in his magic barge. Pigs will fly and sing after this. He saw me help you dip the pool dry, and said that one kind deed deserved another, said the pisky, as meek as a harvest mouse. So he brought me all the way down to St. Minver to know if you'd seen my laugh. Have you seen it, Mr. Giant? No, I have not seen it, answered the giant. Nothing so cheerful as a pisky's laugh would come near such a mountain of misery as I am. If, by an evil chance, it did come, it would flee far from my dark shadow. Do you know anyone else who's seen my laugh? asked the little pisky piteously. "'Not one, unless your cousins and night-riders have,' answered the giant, looking at the sand-ropes he had just finished lying at his feet. "'Now I must begin to bind my trusses of sand.' He stopped to lift them as he spoke, and as he tried to take them up, they fell into pieces in his hand. As they crumbled away, his face was awful to see and he began to howl and roar, and his cries of rage rang over the sand hills and over Trebethric Bay, and were heard above the noise of waves breaking on the Padstow Doombar. Those roars of rage and anger so frightened the people living in the villages of the neighbourhood of the common that they shook in their beds. And as for the little pisky, he was so terrified by what he had heard and seen that he tumbled over the hilltop up which he had climbed, to get into the giant's ear. When he had picked himself up, Giant Tregeagle was flying away like an evil bird toward the south. The dawn broke soon after the giant had gone, and the piskies always hide by day. He hid himself under a clump of tamarisk, and stayed there until the dark and stars came again. When he came out, he remembered what the giant had said, that perhaps his cousins, the night riders, had seen his laugh. The moon being several days older than when the kind little lantern man had taken him to Dosmer Pool, it was now shining brightly over the common, and he knew if the night riders were in the neighbourhood of the sand hills, then they would soon be riding over the common. As he was gazing about with wistful eyes, a young colt came galloping along with scores of little night riders astride his back, and as many more hanging on his mane and tail. The night riders who were little people, no bigger than piskies, and quite as mischievous, had taken the colt, 
from a farmer's stable close to the common, and were enjoying their stolen ride, as only night riders could. As they and the colt drew near, the little pisky stood out in the moonshine and shouted at them. Night riders, night riders, please stop. I want to ask you something. But the little night riders were enjoying their gallop too much to listen or stop, and they flew by like the wind. The colt was fresh and galloping like mad, and soon went round the common and back again, and as he was galloping by, the pisky once more shouted to the little night riders to stop, but they took no heed, and once more flew by like the wind. Ever so many times the colt galloped round the sandy common, leaping over the hillocks in his mad gallop, and each time he passed, the little pisky stood out in the moonshine and called out. But the night riders took not the slightest notice, nor pulled up the colt, to see what he wanted. At last, when the pisky had given up all hope of the night rider stopping, the colt, who was quite worn out with the galloping so hard round and round the broken common, put his foot into a rabbit hole, and came down with a crash, with many little riders on top of him. One little night rider, who happened to be astride the colt's left ear, was pitched off at the pisky's feet. He looked as bright as a robin in his little red riding coat, brown leggings, and his bright green cap with a wren's feather stuck in its front. "'What wish, little beggar, are you?' Oh, "'I'm the poor little chap who's lost his laugh,' answered the pisky. Oh, "'I shouted every time you galloped the colt past here to ask if you'd seen it, but you never stopped.' "'Of course you did not stop galloping because the pisky called,' said the little night rider. "'How came you to be such a gawk as to use your laugh?' Oh, "'I have no idea,' the pisky returned. I only know it went away all of a sudden, and I've been searching for it ever since. Uh, have you seen my lost little laugh? No, but Gempfer Night Rider may have, answered the little Night Rider. He's got wonderful eyes for seeing things that are lost. It's Gempfer Night Rider here, asked the Pisky, sending his glance in the direction of the colt, which was almost smothered with Night Riders, some standing on the side as he lay, others still in the stirrups they had made in his tail and mane. "'I was on top of the coach tail a minute ago,' answered the little night rider following the pisky's glance. "'There he is, pointing to a tiny fellow with a bushy beard, coming toward them, carrying a tamarisk switch in his hand, with which he lashed the air as he came. He wore a red riding coat, green breeches, red cap, and a feather like the other little night riders "'What woe-begotten little rascal are you?' asked the old greybeard, staring hard at the pisky. "'Piskew's lost his laugh,' answered the little night rider for him. "'And he had the impertinence to want us to stop galloping, to tell him if we'd seen it. "'Were well, you very foolish to lose your laugh?' said the Gampfer night rider, standing in front of the unhappy little pisky. "'How did you manage to lose it?' The poor little fellow, without lifting his eyes from the sandy ground, told him. "'You're in queer lane, my son.' said the Grand Fur Knight Rider, when he had told him how he had lost his laugh. And I would not want to give a grain of corn for you. Wouldn't you? wailed the poor little Pisky. No, I wouldn't, nor half a grain neither. Quite a crowd of scarlet-coated little Knight Riders had gathered near the Pisky by this time, and had listened to all that was said. One little Knight Rider asked if a Pisky had ever had the misfortune to lose his laugh before. Yes, once, a long time ago, answered the old greybeard, fixing his eye on the little pisky, who trembled beneath his gaze. And what was worse still, he never found it again. So very unhappy was the little fellow without his laugh, and so miserable did he make everybody with his bewailings, that the last, the pisky tribe to which he belonged, sent out a command that whoever found him wandering about the countryside was to take him in charge as a pisky vagrant put him in a pisky bag and hang him upside down like a woody mouse in the first cavern they came to. He was found, put into a pisky bag, and hung up in a cavern, and here he is still. There he will hang till there are no more small people. Has the order been given for this little pisky vagrant to be taken up and trussed in that manner? asked another little night rider. The poor little Pisky did not want to hear the answer, but took to his heels and ran as fast as he could to the north, and the little night riders, who were still standing on the colt, watched him till he was out of sight, and
and Grenfell Knight Rider and all the other little Knight Riders yelled after him to stop, but he did not stop. The Pisky ran and ran, and he never stopped running till he came to Castle Gardens, where he had started. When he got there, he was exhausted as a colt ridden all night by naughty Knight Riders, and he sank down, all of a heap, by the side of a molehill, where two tiny hands were again sticking up. "'Is your ladyship under the hill?' asked the little Pisky, when he could speak. "'Yes,' answered the Mole. "'Who are you?' Oh, "'The little Pisky lost his laugh.' "'What? Haven't you found it yet?' "'No,' he answered sadly. "'But I am dreadfully afraid I never shall. "'If I don't find it soon, I shall be taken up for a Pisky vagrant, "'put in a bag and hung upside down like a witty mouse in some cavern.' "'Well?' "'That will be a very tragic ending to a bright little pisky,' said the Mole. "'Tell me, how do you know that it will be your fate if you don't find your laugh?' And the pisky told her. In fact, the Lady Want was so interested about what Grenfell Knight Rider had said that she begged him to tell her all his adventures from the time he set out to Rough Tor Marsh in search of his laugh till his return to Castle Gardens, which he was quite glad to do. "'You ought to find your laugh.' "'After all your travels and what you've gone through,' said the Lady Want, when he had related everything, "'and I hope you will. "'Does your ladyship happen to know anybody else who might have seen my laugh?' asked the little Pisky, wistfully. "'Only one.' "'And who may that be?' queried the little Pisky. "'Will your ladyship be kind enough to tell me?' "'The good King Arthur,' the Mole answered in a low voice. "'Good King Arthur!' ejaculated the Pisky. "'Why, he's dead, and a dead king's no more good than a Pisky without his laugh.' "'King Arthur's not dead,' said the Mole. "'Not dead?' echoed the Pisky, in great surprise. "'No. He was seen perched only last evening on his own seat, which is still called King Arthur's seat, and which, as I dare say you know, overhangs the sea.' "'King Arthur!' It's not dead, whispered the little Pisky, as if he could not get over his excitement. Oh, precious good thing he isn't, snapped the Mole. But how isn't he dead? asked the little Pisky. Because he was changed by magic into a bird, answered the Mole. He haunts the Dantagel cliffs and the ruins of his old castle in the form of a chuff. He was wounded, almost unto death, in his last great battle, it's true, she added, for the small man looked as if he wanted this strange happening fully explained. And the marks of the battle he fought, and the hurts he received are yet upon him, as the legs and beak of the great black bird plainly show, as plainly as my own tiny hands, that I was once a graced lady. But he is still alive. If you should see a bird with a red beak, and legs flying over King Arthur's castle, as day is beginning to break, you may be quite certain that he is King Arthur, and if he has seen your laugh, he will be sure to tell you. He is very kind and good, as all the world knows. I am glad the good King Arthur is not dead, said the little Pisky. I'll try and keep awake till the dawn, so I can ask him about my laugh, but I'm so tired. The little fellow did his best to keep awake. But he was too worn out from his run from St. Minver's Sand Hills to Tintagel Castle to sit and watch for the coming of the red-legged bird, and long before the sun wheeled up behind the tors and shone upon the sea, he was sound asleep under a great mallow growing by one of the grey old walls. When he awoke, a day and a night had come and gone, and the birth of a new day was at hand. When he crawled out from under the mallow, the first thing on the island facing him was a dark form of a great black chuff. He was perched on the wall above the old arched doorway, gazing gravely in front of him. The Pisky lost not a moment in getting across to the island, which he did by the Pisky passage known only to the Piskies. And when he had caught the bird's attention, he said, "'I'm the poor little Pisky who's lost his laugh. I've come to ask the good King Arthur if he's seen it.' But the bird was too high up for him to make himself heard, and he had to wait patiently till it flew down. 
After waiting a short time, it did, and perched on a stick, stuck in the ground. The Pisky ran over, and, clasping his hands, he repeated what he'd just said. "'How came you to know I was King Arthur?' asked the Chuff, ignoring the little fellow's question. "'The Molu says she's the Lady Want told me,' he answered. "'Ah, I know her. The Grand Lady, who considered the ground on which she walked, was not good enough for her dainty feet, and has now, as punishment, to walk under the ground, a lesson to all children of pride. Oh, but please, good King Arthur, answer my question about my laugh, pleaded the little Pisky, in an agony of impatience. If I don't find it soon, something dreadful will happen to me. Have patience, said the Chuff kindly. Nothing is ever won by impatience. I have seen something very funny lately running about over the grass. It is like nothing I have ever seen before, except in a Pisky's face when he laughs. It is like a laugh gone mad, and it is enough to kill a man with laughing, only to watch its antics. It made me laugh until I ached when I first noticed it. It does not make a sound, but its grimaces are worth flying a hundred miles to see. Oh, it must have been my laugh you saw, cried the Pisky. My dear little lost laugh, oh, I've travelled so far to find. Where is it now, good King Arthur? It was here not long since, answered the bird who did not deny he was Arthur the king. "'Why, there it is, quite close to you,' pointing with his long pointed beak to the most comical-looking thing you ever saw on the grass, a foot from where the Pisky was standing. "'It was a laugh gone mad,' as the chuff said. The Pisky looked behind him, and when he saw the little bit of laughing, grinning absurdity, on the grass, he jumped for joy and shrieked, "'It's my own little laugh that I lost!' Holding out both arms, he cried, "'Oh, dear little laugh, come back to me! Oh, dear little laugh, come back!' And the droll little thing, which was a grin with a laugh and a laugh with a grin, came over to the Pisky and began to climb up his legs, grinning and doubling itself up with laughter as it climbed, till it reached his chin, where it narrowed itself into a tiny grin and vanished into the Pisky. The next moment the Pisky was shouting at the top of his voice, I've got my laugh! I've got my laugh! And he ran off, laughing and dancing, to the edge of the cliff, and disappeared into the Pisky hole. In a few moments more he was on Castle Gardens, in the great Pisky ring, laughing and dancing and dancing and laughing. His laugh was so loud and so free that his brother Piskies heard him from afar, and came running over the cliffs from Brossany to see whatever had happened. Little Fiddler Pisky was the first to reach the gardens, and the first glance at the little whirling figure told him that his little brother had found his laugh, and putting his fiddle in position, he began fiddling away as hard as he could. As he fiddled, the other Piskies, including Grandpa Pisky, reached the ring, and the next minute they were all dancing and laughing as they had never laughed and danced before. But the one who laughed the heartiest was the little Pisky, who had lost and found his laugh. They danced for a good hour, the little fiddler in their mist, fiddling his fiddle, all the while keeping time with his head and foot, heedless that the daylight was driving the darkness away to the country to which it belongs. And King Arthur the bird flew up on the wall and watched, and the mole, who called herself the Lady Want, let her dainty hands be seen on the molehill, till the fiddling, dancing, and laughing were finished, and the piskies went off to the pisky beds to sleep. End of the Adventures of a Pisky in Search of His Laugh in Myths and Legends Around the World Collection 16 Read by The One Who Wanders Liverpool, May 27th, 2022